We are going to move on to the next speaker, who is Mario Juris. He is an associate professor and senior data scientist at the University of Washington. Uh, so please, Mario, go ahead. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you. Thanks to um, thank you for inviting me and for inviting um, the the CIMA collaboration to give this talk. Um, just to briefly introduce myself, my name is Mario Urich. I'm an astronomer at the University of Washington and director of our uh, Dirac Institute for Data Intensive Astronomy. But here I'm speaking to you on behalf of the CIMA collaboration uh, about scalable infrastructure to support multi messenger astrophysics. So. This talk is going to be slightly different than the previous three that we heard of, um, because this will be more about multi-messenger astrophysics than uh, necessarily about applications of AI. Um, what is multi-messenger astrophysics? It's really an area that combines um, observations from either electromagnetic emission, gravitational wave uh, waves, particles, neutrinos, et cetera, from the same astrophysical source in order to understand uh, something more about the physics that's governing that source. And if you look across the spectrum of use cases for, for this area of science, you're gonna notice one commonality, which is we detect the sources in um, one area, either in, in, in one range of the magnetic spectrum or particles or something else. And then we try to combine that information with detections from um, other messengers. So the typical workflow here that we have is once there's a potential discovery, let's say an early warning of compact binary merger via gravitational waves, we want to quickly combine all the available information we have about it, perhaps from different detectors, make inferences about what this could be, how interesting this is, make decisions about whether we want to follow it up and then trigger follow-up. And that follow-up happens on large networks of telescopes and in essence, it's extremely urgent, typically. It's the kind of thing where you drop everything else on the floor that's happening that, that night and, and go follow it up. Um, to understand why we've undertaken this project, let me tell a little bit about how follow-up is done today. So typically, follow-up begins by receiving an alert by GCN or, or an, uh, another automatic um, um, uh, network that is, in essence, an email saying, hey, LIGO has discovered a potentially um, um, a new, a potential new merger. And the first reaction is to panic uh, because you know that your, your night is the next couple of hours. This is the next couple of days. Like this is what you're going to do. Uh, the next reaction is to go and grab, uh, open up um, scheduling forms uh, for all the programs that uh, you yourself as an astronomer have, um, have uh, or the telescopes that you, have, you yourself as an astronomer have permission to use to try to go and find out where this object might be, see it again in the electromagnetic spectrum. The next thing you realize is that the resources you have are insufficient to maybe to discover this object or discover the EM counterpart of this object. And what you want to do then is depending on what this object is, quickly ad hoc find others who have complementary resources and form collaborations. Um, or you know, phone up a, an observatory director to get some direct discretionary time, um, as, as, as Andy put it in this, in this board, beg, plead, cajole for time. Because all we need is, uh, what we need is, is, is in, this, in this hunting stage, uh, really need more telescopes to do follow-up. And then after that, You've done the, uh, you've taken the observations, but now those observations have ended up across many different archives, many different interfaces. You need to download the data, you need to reduce it, you need to understand what's there. Um, and then you communicate that information to the community. And, and again, that goes out uh, essentially via an email message. So as you can imagine, this is not an ideal system, um, especially not for something that's extremely time sensitive. And you know, Lord help us all if, two of these happen at the same time, or three of these. And just as we were writing this proposal a couple of years ago, this is exactly what happened. And then on top of just you know, step two with one object, you have um, step two with multiple objects. And these don't scale linearly, but um, as, as only squared at least. What's our vision for tomorrow? What we'd like to have, the situation we'd like to have is we'd like to be able to receive the alert quickly in an automated way have some sense of where this alert is in the sky, what are the optimal telescopes to use, and direct those telescopes to automatically observe targets, negotiate priorities, data access, and so forth. 
We also want the data to be automatically reduced and then instantly made available to your collaboration as this happened. And then finally, you want to have both machines and humans make inference of all of this as the data on, on all on this object as the data are arriving from different telescopes, um, update your inferences of what it might be, schedule more observations and repeat. But you'd like to have this all in a coordinated and organized fashion. And this is what started this project, this, uh, this inability to do what I just described today. Um, this started in, in 2018, 2019 era with a series of workshops uh, that led to a number of white papers that formed into a vision for an institute to enable and support the data flow and collaborative networks of people and instruments to enable um, this kind of, of, of uh, a follow-up and analysis of uh, multi-messenger sources. This turned into a full-fledged HDR, Windows of the Universe project. Um, uh, the, the, the name of the project is Framework for Data Intensive Discovery in Multi-Messenger Astrophysics. Um, and this is a two-year project where we're trying to prototype both the technologies for this vision that I just described, um, and also the processes, the institute, the, the community that's going to use this. So the, our, 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 quick, our initial goals, our basic two goals are prototype the solutions that address the immediate needs for MLA. In this case, it's follow-up. And then build a community and the baseline design for an institute to support uh, MMA in the, in the next decade. Um, there are four primary products we've been working on over the past year and then we're working on um, in, in the year to come. Um, one is a modern pub sub technology for message passing. So emails will not cut it when you're having um, one of these or, or more than one of these uh, objects per day. We need something that's scalable, something that's low latency, something that's secure and extensible, and we need client libraries for both interactive and programmatic use. So we started by focusing on, on pub sub technology uh, for message passing. We need an integrated federated identity and access management system. And because what's going on here, these are objects that are extremely valuable. Uh, discoveries here are potentially Nobel Prize worthy. Collaborations are created ad hoc or in advance. Um, it's critical for, for people to trust the system, for all the constituents to trust the system that if they send something uh, via, via these interfaces, that that message is going to be received only by people who are authorized to see it. Um, three, uh, you want to be able to archive um, messages that are passing through the system so that um, you can later on um, do, do post-discovery analysis. Um, things like understanding selection functions, uh, more detailed modeling, et cetera. And you need to have interfaces with web portals for easy access to it. And then finally, uh, you want to, to, to make this accessible through an, an easily, easy to use analysis platform. Um, one of the things we want to enable here is collaboration. And um, one of the kind of silly examples that I, that I give here, but, but a simple one that explains it pretty well is, is Overly for Google Docs. Um, Think about how much easier is it to collaboratively work with something if you can open the same document and type at it at the same time. We like the similar kind of experience here. Um, on top of the, the products, there are also services and processes. Um, this has to be reliable. So if, if uh, people are changing messages about high value target over, over a pop sub system, you need to make sure that that system is, is always up and running. Um, it's the way this is developed is, is actually through a distributed team of developers. So this is um, um, shaping up a virtual institute and those kinds of software projects are always difficult. So we need to demonstrate that that will actually work. And then finally, we need models for engagement with the community. So here we're providing services to the community, both the data producers and the researchers that are going to be using them. How are we going to bring those services out? How are we going to teach them how to use this? Uh, how are they going to approach us? So these seven things, the, the four products and these services and processes are the things that we've been uh, we're working on over the past year. And I'm going to focus on, on one of these, on the modern PubSub technology for message passing um, that we call Hopscotch. Um, why is message passing hard? Um, in our case, what we need to do is we need to send out alerts. Imagine LIGO discovering a new gravitational wave um, um, signal and you need to reliably um, um, tell the whole world about it. You need strong delivery guarantees. 
um, you need to be able to, 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 or LIGO folks need to be confident that if they send out an alert on this network, everybody who's subscribed to it is going to receive it. We need high throughput. Um, one of the things we talked about, this may not just be for, for LIGO, you know, for, for events that come out, you know, maybe a few per night, but also events that, um, and messages that happen at a level of a thousands per night. If you're coordinating telescopes using this as, as, as the backend, that's the kind of situations you might, you might have. There may be many clients. Um, the number may differ from, from minute to minute, from a few to thousands. Um, this is meant to span the globe. So this has to operate over wide area networks and has to be resilient to both the machines and networks being um, 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 having issues uh, while, while this network is operating. It has to be reliable. Um, you truly shouldn't, shouldn't miss opportunities because something like this isn't, uh, isn't operational. There are things to consider like existing legacy protocols, different backends for different situations, usability by not experts, which leads us to strong Python support as well. So what do we decide to use here? Um, we first turned around and, and looked at what's there in the industry. And there are a number of, um, sorry, in, in astronomy, and there are a number of existing protocols that have served us extraordinarily well so far. But the issue is that they become, uh, they, they become increasingly problematic as you're looking towards scalability and, and robustness. So what are we going to do next? Are we going to try to build uh, another protocol for astronomy or do we try to, to take a look in the industry and see what solutions are there? And if we do that, um, which I think everybody today agrees is, is the right thing to do, um, you discover that we are not unique. Um, the largest companies out there are having exactly the same problems. Um, they have data that needs to be serialized, transmitted, streams, fused, results classified, acted upon, et cetera. And so that brought us to the design of Hopscotch, which is in essence, Apache Kafka on the back end, um, Python on the front end, and it can be run either as a cloud service that we operate and you simply connect to or on-prem. And combination of these gives you a scalable, reliable, and extensible PubSub system with IAM integration. So we can actually know who's connected or you can know who's connected and who, who's allowed to see uh, different kinds of messages that are going through, the, through this uh, network. Um, the basic concept here is we, we have a PubSub system. We have a server that exposes a number of message queues that in Kafka terminology are called topics. And these messages can be anything. Hopscotch really treats them as opaque blobs. Uh, by convention, we prefer JSON. Uh, there are other types of messages we, you, can, you can push through. So ZTF, for example, is publishing its CAN page um, in, in Avro. Um, one or more users can publish messages to topics. One or more users can subscribe to multiple topics, receiving any messages published to a topic. The messages are, and this is important, guaranteed to be delivered at least once. Um, so you're guaranteed that the message is not going to disappear, but you might receive the same message twice, or you might receive a certain message before the other. Um, there are, you know, we're, we're considering whether to strengthen this, this um, um, guarantee to, to deliver to delivery exactly once, but there are some pros and cons here, and at least once delivery seems to be like the right um, um, sweet spot between uh, what's, uh, what's possible and, and what's needed. Importantly here, all users are authenticated and access to topics can be restricted. So we, we, uh, it's possible for only you and your collaboration to use a certain part of the system. And again, the access to all of this is through fairly simple to use Python um, interfaces. So you don't need to, to know Scala, you don't need to understand the details of Kafka, any of that. Uh, you simply need to download uh, the library that, that uses all this and uh, use file-like Python interfaces to get onto it. What about performance? Uh, we've tested this on ZTF, which is not necessarily a typical multi-messenger astronomy facility, um, but ZTF does produce between 600,000 to 1.2 million alerts per night. So that's about, and they're, they're quite sizable um, messages. So think about you know, 70 gigabytes of data being, being transferred um, every night. And on ZTF, we, we were able to run um, more than 2 million alerts per night with, with no issues and on a fairly modest machine. Um, demonstrated actually transfers of up to 80 megabytes per second. 
Um, and this is from uh, Seattle to San Francisco. So this is on a, on a, on a, on a wide area network. Um, the latency is um, essentially, um, it's, it's, it's minimal. It's between uh, 10, I'm sorry, this should say milliseconds, tens of, oh, tens of milliseconds to hundreds of milliseconds. And it's, it's almost entirely bandwidth limited. Um, the, the, the Kafka to Kafka latency is, 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 is in essence negligible. So this gives us a nice um, kind of low level system to, to, to build upon. Um, the combination of these things in the HubSpot suite are, uh, as I mentioned, the HubSpot server, which is in essence Kafka, uh, right now running our deployment on, on AWS. Um, there are client libraries, there's Hub clients. Um, uh, here I'm, I'm giving you the GitHub repository, but it's, uh, it's also installable through Conda and um, from, from Conda Forge um, and through um, just simple pip. And there are a number of example hopscotch applications, that is applications that connect to the system either to receive messages or send messages. And we have a demo one, uh, for example, that we receive messages and we post them to um, a Slack channel if you're choosing. You have three minutes left, Mary. Sounds good. Um, to another thing that we that we um, looked at here is um, how do we make it possible? How do we make this development possible uh, from the point of view of, of a distributed team? Um, we're using distributed Scrum, uh, two week sprints, uh, GitHub, Slack, plus Zoom for coordination, and it has worked wonderfully. This has been um, by far the, um, um, the the most streamlined distributed project uh, that I've been on. And one of the things we've tried doing over the last minute over the last um, two months is experimenting with outreach. Um, so we've now built a prototype of the system. How do we um, make it possible for the community to use it? Uh, we have teamed up with the Snooze team. Um, Chris and I'll give you a, um, an, an, uh, an overview of Didact, so the, the project that, um, um, that, uh, that funds Snooze um, as, as um, um, the Snooze part of this collaboration. We've engaged with them on upgrading Snooze to a version 2.0 um, to enable it to scale further in the future. Um, and we do this by, if you have your, your team that has an application that can get that can utilize this kind of a, a messaging system, we'll, we, we're, we're trying an experiment where we detail one or two people from our team to work with your team for a month or two to, to, to bring the technology, bring their technology close to towers and vice versa do the knowledge transfer, and then um, a few months later, hand it off and, um, and, and see if we have a, a workable product. And the results with, with the Snooze team after two months was that now we have a Snooze 2.0 prototypes running on Hopscotch, and it's been really a fantastic collaboration, an example of, of what can be done um, in the middle of the pandemic as well, if I may say. Um, looking ahead for pro towards prototyping, we're looking at improvements to Hopscotch. And then we're looking at uh, things that I didn't have time to talk about, uh, building a database to archive the messages that are passing through and web interfaces on top of that. And we're going to set up an analysis platform for MMA so to make it easy to access all these data remotely uh, through Jupyter type interfaces um, and, uh, and do some analysis on it. And as we're doing this, we are, Collaborating with with another group, uh, with another initiative that's that's really kind of being or organically growing within astronomy called the Astronomy Data Commons, where the idea is to think about shifting large data sets into data lakes, either on the cloud, whether it's public or um, on the cloud, whether it's public or private, leverage industry standard uh, big data analytics solutions to enable multiple science platforms to access all these data and to to fuse them as necessary. And so what we're looking at is to add the multi-messenger aspects uh, to, to, this, uh, to this data lake and the astronomy data commons vision. So to wrap this up, um, what are we doing now? We are shifting slowly towards, um, well, shifting rapidly towards uh, the, the community building and design aspects of, the, of an institute to support uh, MMA into the 2030s. So that means writing down what we've learned, um, starting to, 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 to write white papers and think about proposals. We'd like to have an institute that serves the MMA community by operating and supporting the development of cyber infrastructure systems and algorithms for data intensive multi-messenger science. This includes education workforce development. We meet by telecon. Um, there's public telecon monthly every first Tuesday of, of each month. 
all the tools that, that I talked about are open, starting with Hopscotch. And we also host training and um, 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 workshops to broaden and deepen the collaboration uh, with the community. So I'll leave you with this slide on how to get involved. Um, these slides are gonna be posted, so you don't have to be um, writing down all of these links. Uh, but the one link that I'd like to, to point you to is this um, tiny URL link to our YouTube channel uh, with numerous meeting recordings and demos. So you can get a feel for, for some of this technology and what we're trying to do um, and maybe try it out yourself. So thank you all and I'm happy to take um, any questions. Thanks a lot, Mario. Really nice presentation. Um, hi, hi, this is, this is Kyle. Kyle. I wanted to ask if uh, the, the NSF has the Science Gateways uh, uh, project. I'm just curious uh, if you like interacted with them very much in the context of this. I mean, you're sort of focusing on a very you know, targeted uh, you know, use case and community. And I think it's really fantastic. I'm very, very impressed. I'm just curious what that, what that interaction is like. Yeah, the, 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 there is an interaction. We, we, we focused so far in development, we focused mostly on the back end of the system. And I think the interaction with the Gateways Institute is going to happen this year. Uh, but but that, is, that is definitely planned. Thank you. Thank you. Eric? Uh, thank you for the presentation, Mario. Uh, can I ask if you envision LSST to be using the platform you're developing and or what is your relations, let's say, relation, let's say, with LSST and what is uh, going to need in terms of distributing alerts in uh, real time? So we, we are envisioning this to be of mm -hmm. use to LSST, but not in the sense that we're going to be receiving every single LSST alert that goes that LSST emits um, or that we're going to serve as a general purpose broker for LSST. In, in the MMA context, Interestingly enough, uh, LSST is a follow-up machine rather than, than a discovery machine. And the way I see LSST largely using this is by being triggered by, by you know, a combination of one or more um, um, messengers or alerts coming into this, uh, this system and you know, some set of processing deciding that this is extremely an extremely important event that um, sufficiently important event to, to, to you know, tell LSST to drop what it's doing and go follow up. Um, I am in, in within. Um, I'm part of the LSST project. We also have folks who are um, um, on LIGO and on, on IceCube. We're very much keeping in touch with uh, with with all the all the major projects. Um, and yes, the, the the intent is that this is useful to all of them. Thanks a lot, Mario. It was Thank you. very enlightening.